So um, before I start, just a little bit of a, a disclaimer, maybe a spoiler alert. Uh, my words tonight are PG-13. So if there are little kids here who don't want to necessarily see the rabbi have a little bit of a meltdown, they're welcome to, to get up, go stretch, or do whatever. But they're also welcome to stay on one condition, that if something that I say disturbs them or, or bothers them or scares them, they have, to, they have to come after Shabbat services, say Shabbat Shalom Rabbi Khan, I'll say Shabbat Shalom back, and then they can tell me what they're feeling or thinking so that I can help work through it with them. Just wanted to be honest with you. First time in 27 years I did a disclaimer. That was it. So there you have it. Same for you online. Although you can't physically, you can call me later. So before I begin now, this is the second false start, let's all give thanks to God for the release of Judith and Natalie Ranan, two captives from among the what we believe to be 203 kidnapped who were kidnapped from their home on October 7th at the hands of Hamas. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, matir asurim, praise to you Adonai our God, sovereign of the universe, who frees the captive. Now Hanukkah, as you know, is the next holiday. We are in Cheshvan. Cheshvan is also called Mar Cheshvan, or bitter Cheshvan. Bitter because there are no holy days at all. Thank God, in the month of, that we are in right now, Cheshvan. And so even though Hanukkah is our next holiday, which doesn't begin for seven weeks, around, more or less, we have heavy hearts still for the remaining 201 that we know of hostages who are still being held, God knows where, in the tunnels we presume half a mile underneath Gaza with the money that we gave them. I have no words to explain my feelings, and I want to thank Rabbi Mason Barkin for sharing such profound words. It is not often, even with all of our training and experience, for a rabbi to be able to take time and space and place and put words to it with our tradition, and Rabbi Mason Barkin did that last week so, so beautifully. I watched it from my hotel room in Washington, D.C., so since I have no words, I turned to Ma'otsur. Ma'otsur being that all too well known song for Hanukkah. The problem with Ma'otsur is we only sing the first stanza. There are actually six stanzas. The sixth stanza helped me find some words of response to how it is that I'm feeling now almost two weeks after the pogrom in southern Israel. And I did find some solace in the second stanza, which reads, Ra'ot sav'a nafshi v'yagon kochi kala. My soul has been sated with troubles. My strength has been consumed with grief. They had embittered my life with hardship, with the calf-like kingdom's bondage. But with God's great power, God brought forth the treasured ones. Pharaoh's army and all his offspring went down like a stone into the deep. It is always beautiful and wonderful to be Jewish, mainly because there is always a Jewish text to say the words that we cannot speak ourselves. I simply don't have the words for the feelings to match it up. I cannot express them, but I find comfort in knowing that I can look at a song like Ma'utsur from our beautiful, rich, and ancient tradition that fits perfectly in this moment. Not my words, but the words of the communities and the generations before, which express the rawness of feelings like we are having right now. The words sad, horrified, angry, shocked, all of those words are so insufficient in times like this. To paraphrase the journalist Brett Stevens earlier this week, 
He said, it sort of feels like my rage and my anguish, anguish have been in competition these past two weeks. I think I'm going to let the rage win, even on Shabbat. I also want to acknowledge that I understand just how stressful this is for us following COVID, following all kinds of political turmoil in our country, and following the stress that we feel with the 24-hour news cycle and social media like we needed something else. I understand. But this isn't that kind of stress. Not the kind of stress we feel after a difficult day at work or school, or even the stress we feel when we experience a minor trauma, which we all do. In a way, this kind of stress goes bone deep, and it permeates our mind's ability to process it and filter it. This kind of stress goes straight to the heart. It's, ex it's exhausting. And I really feel it's exhausting for God, too. Now, I'll admit that the idea of even speaking coherently with you about our stress is nothing in light of what those held in captivity are experiencing at this moment, our Jewish brothers and sisters and our fellow Americans, our fellow human beings, along with, think about it, all of their families, the stress of their parents and their spouses, the friends that they have, their nephews, their nieces, and cousins, their lifelong friends, of those who have been called to also serve the Jewish people and Israel and the IDF. How are they feeling? It feels a little trite to say, I'm stressed. For them, for all of them, we have to be strong, which is also a trite thing to say. But we have to be strong in our acts and our deeds. And as Rabbi Mason Barkin said last week, light is not just the antidote. It is the answer. To be an or la goyim, a light to the nations. To do mitzvahs, to light candles, to be together. We have to try to be coherent when we speak to the stupid. It's important for us to be coherent. When we speak to those people about even the most mundane ideas, we have to use our words and our minds. Can we even imagine? The answer is no. The horror our sisters and brothers in Israel feel Right now, as they stand at the actual front lines, they don't even know if they caught all of the members of Hamas yet. Can we imagine what it must feel like on those front lines when your neighbors and your friends and your family bleed? I'm not doing the Jewish math, and this is like 9-11, because I don't do that. But this was horrific. That's a word that's not sufficient. Along with all of us in the diaspora, they are living in a moment of life-changing history. And if you're Jewish right now and don't know it, we are living in a moment of seismic shifts in Jewish history. The kind of spiritual seismic shift for all of us. Just as we teach our children about the wars of 48, 67, 73, one day we're going to teach our grandchildren and children about the War of 23, the historic war that began with the unimaginable pogrom of October 7th in, of all places, Israel, where it was never, ever supposed to happen. That was the promise. And we pray that this War of 23, no matter how long or how short, will end when the kind of victory that will change the course of the future of the Jewish state and the Jewish people. We pray that one day we will speak of that time when the state of Israel defeated, destroyed, and decimated Hamas and delivered them to the gates of Gehenna to be left there for eternity. Now, I acknowledge these words are a bit crude, 
I know as I'm saying them and as I wrote them that my anguish and my modern sensibilities kick in and remind me to right the ship, to remember that thoughts and feelings should coexist. But friends, I don't know how you feel, but I'm going to tell you something that I've not told you before. It has become so very clear to me as one of the many, many thoughts and takeaways, something that I have felt deep inside my kishka since I was a child, about the place of the Jew in the world today, because it came true. The world does not give a damn about us. The world does not care. They despise us. They despise the idea of Jewish power, and they could not care less about the death of Jewish people. The incident with the hospital in Gaza this week, that incident alone was one speck of a long story that when bad things happen, blame the Jew. One tiny example of how easy in a second, in a second, the world can be told by every news outlet, every newspaper, every online forum to blame the Jew first and then ask questions later. Even in their retractions, did you notice how painful it was for the media outlets to clarify the story, how suspicious they still were, how they kept questioning the IDF. Are you sure? Could it have been? Why couldn't they just listen to what we've been telling them for decades? Hamas does not care about their people. They put those launchers there on purpose. We're not lying. We weren't lying. We were telling you the truth. But I also know that there are a lot of questions for our people, especially the younger people, who are living in this nightmare that is the university campus today. They are seeking answers to important Jewish questions, and I want to underline it because their questions, their Jewish questions, are what we should be proud of even if they're not the questions that we ourselves would necessarily ask. Why do we pray for destroying other people, they ask? Is it okay for a Jew to pray for another person to be killed? Is it a Jewish value to pray for the death of a child? What about innocent people? These are fair and good questions for our kids to ask. Please do not answer them with anger. They're asking those questions because we taught them what Judaism stands for. And now they have to reconcile those feelings and those thoughts of spirit and mind with the reality that so many of us know. But maybe what I'm asking this Shabbat is different and awful to say. Maybe what I am asking really is it, is, is, it, is it okay to give myself permission to want evil people who raped and pillaged and tortured and burned alive our babies? Is it okay for me to want them all completely obliterated? Is it okay for a modern, educated, nice Jewish boy from San Francisco who has prayed for peace every single night before I go to sleep after I recite the Shema, is it okay for me to wipe, want to wipe them out? Is it okay just this once for my anger to be justified? These are the, question that, the questions that Noah never asked in this week's Parsha with his name. Noah was the first ever useful idiot of the Bible in that he just went along. Vatishchet ha'aretz lifnei ha'Elohim vatimale ha'aretz Hamas. Yes, you heard the word Hamas. It appears in the first verses of Noah. The earth became corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with Hamas. 
The Arabic word Hamas, of course, is the acronym for the Islamic resistance movement, but likely, and not coincidentally, its name comes from the Hebrew word, which means chaos, bloodshed, and deceit in Bible. Noah asked not one question. He wasn't a good Jewish kid raised in a nice Reformed synagogue. He wasn't even Jewish. He asked no questions, and perhaps because Noah understood, maybe on a deep level, that there is no moral equivocation when dealing with Hamas, utter and complete chaos and evil. Vayas Noah kechol asher tzivauto Elohim kenasa. Noah did just as God had commanded. He built the ark. There is a time and a place to ask questions and probe reasonable and rational solutions and speak of peace and salvation and good things. Like Abraham in the Torah portion two weeks from now, Vayera. As Jews, we are hardwired to argue with God in matters of life and death. In Parshat Vayera, Abraham will argue with God. He is righteous demanding God to not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, which probably were Hamas-like for the sake of any righteous people he could find. A nice Jewish boy, this Abraham. His righteous act of fighting for the righteous in order to save all of the evil. I'm sorry, to, to, to fight for the righteous in order to save them, to spare them from the evildoers. According to the rabbis, deems him our first ancestor, that's why he gets that crown and becomes the archetype of what Judaism stands for. But even Abraham's goodness cannot act as a counter in that story to God's ultimate punishment, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Even Abraham's goodness can't act as a counter now when it comes to how we respond to Jew hatred. As we know, there are 613 mitzvot in the Torah, positive and negative. Now, we don't observe all of these mitzvot, not because we're Reformed Jews, but because we're moderns. Of the 613 mitzvot, the positive commandments, the positive mitzvot include things like observe Shabbat, light candles, place a mezuzah on your doorpost. And the negative include, for example, from the Ten Commandments, the thou shalt nots. Don't steal, don't murder, don't covet, and so on. There are, in Torah, three commandments, however. Two positive and one negative concerning Amalek, the eternal enemy of the Jewish people. The Amalekites, somewhat not ironically, were a nomadic group of people living in the Sinai Desert and the part of the Negev, just south of the territory of Judah, likely including modern-day Gaza. You may recall that the Amalekites symbolize the root of evil in the world, and that among their descendants, according to rabbinic tradition, include Haman, the Crusaders, the Inquisitors of Spain, and Hitler. And today, the leaders of Hamas, Hezbollah, and Islamic Jihad. While the Amalekites lived in biblical times, where they, first encountered, they are first encountered in the book of Exodus, right after the Israelites left, they were the ones, hear this, also according to Jewish tradition, who introduced anti-Semitism, more specifically the hatred of Jews, more specifically the killing of the weak ones, into the world. The three mitzvot concerning Amalek and their descendants appear in Deuteronomy. Remember what Amalek did to you on your journey after you left Egypt. Zachor, et asher asa lecha Amalek baderech b'tzeit chem Mitzrayim. That's the first. The next two are part of a larger verse. V'haya b'haniya chadonai lohecha timche et zecher Amalek Therefore, when Adonai, your God, grants you safety from all your enemies around you in the land that Adonai is giving you as a, a hereditary portion, 
you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under the heaven. And now the negative commandment, do not forget. Lo tishkach. Two positives, one negative. Why Amalek? Why not the Moabites, the Jebusites, the Edomites, or other ites or eons that appear in Torah? Well, in a story that is so eerily similar to what happened on October 7th, we are taught that the Amalekites staged a sneak attack on the defenseless, weak, weak, lagging Israelites who were at the rear of the migration after the exodus from Egypt, an attack that showed Amalek to be uncommonly ruthless, lacking even the most elementary decency. The Amalekites were genocidal. This is why the Amalekites stood out as the eternal enemy of the Jewish people and not those other groups. Isn't that strange and eerie? That's why the Torah is called an eternal document. What happened then can happen now. At the center of each mitzvah is the fundamental Jewish verb in these verses from Deuteronomy, Zahor, to remember what Amalek meant then and now. And I, for one, will never read them the same ever again. These verses contain one of the most fundamental aspects of Jewish theology, Jewish life, Jewish memory. Do not forget, remember. Memory and forgetfulness of those who hated us specifically can be a matter of life and death, Torah teaches, even for those who live now. It is actually part of our Jewish DNA. I've never thought that kashrut is necessarily part of our Jewish DNA. I've never thought that not driving on Shabbat is part of our Jewish DNA, but I have always known that Zahor is. To never forget, to always remember, that behold, door of a door, in every generation, the Jewish people have enemies who want nothing more than for us to die and disappear from the face of the earth forever. It is not just a moral imperative to remember, it is a matter of our people's life or death. To not view the events of two weeks ago as the setting of the War of 23 is to commit a grave sin of these three myths folk. They say 1,400 Jews died on October 7th. But I promise you with every fiber of my being that had they had more time and been given the opportunity, they would have killed 10 times more. They would have killed 7 million Jews living in Israel if they could. The only thing that stopped them was time ran out. And then there are the non-Amalekites. These are a little bit trickier because they're people who we get really, really, really mad at, but they're not necessarily our enemies. In the cases I'm going to point out, they happen to be Jews. And these are the protesters. You know, the protesters, I could care less. Personally, I could care less. Getting a group of lemmings to follow the herd and yell at the top of their lungs about their utter hatred for Jews with their crocodile tears because they hate the fact that we have power. It doesn't bother me. I'm sort of used to it and, quite honestly, numb to it. I actually don't care. But what I find indefensible, dare I say heretical, are those Jews and those who are educated and those with the PhDs and who's, or who are able to articulate with massive platforms, those who could not wait to pounce, who wouldn't even allow the Israelites to conduct a proper shiva because it took so long and is still taking so long to identify bodies that have been completely burnt out. They couldn't wait and they decided to pounce and they pounced. Journalists like our good friend, fellow Jew, Thomas Friedman, who penned an editorial this past week why is Israel acting this way, question mark, wherein he wrote, if you think that the events of October 7th made Israel crazy, it's because Hamas punched Israel in the face, humiliated it, and then poked out one of their eyes. So now Israel believes, as you've seen from their actions in the last couple of weeks, to God forbid defend themselves, 
that it must restore its deterrence by proving that it can and will out-crazy Hamas and their latest craziness. I didn't know that fighting back was craziness. Or one of my favorites, Michelle Goldberg, also of the New York Times, wrote an article this week piling up horror upon horror, where she states, as atrocities are piled upon atrocities, I hope Jews will attend to what is being threatened in our name, and all Americans should pay attention, given how much money our country underwrites Israel's military. A Jew. And Peter Beinhart never ceases to amaze me. Without even allowing the first funeral, he pounces as a guest columnist in the New York Times with an article, this gem, I love it. There is a Jewish hope for Palestinian liberation and it must survive. I have nothing even PG-13 to say about this piece, but I'm so grateful Mr. Beinhardt, such a good Jew, sends his kids to day school and goes on CNN and talks about it did not fail to miss the opportunity to compare the state of Israel to apartheid South Africa in the first paragraph. You see, it seems that our country, even here in the United States, is filled with really, really smart, really well-educated, and highly articulate idiots. Useful idiots, they have been called throughout history, and I use that word on purpose. The fact that they are Jews is humiliating, the fact that they have joined the chorus along with millions who use these very same ideas to intellectualize an argument toward the destruction of the Jewish state and the Jewish people is just sinful. Along with university presidents, academics, and other really, really useful idiots, they chose that moment, not even after, Sh not even after Shiva had started for so many families, to argue on behalf of the Palestinians of Gaza. The journalist Shmirit Meir, one of Israel's sharpest observers of the Arab world, commented that the Hamas operation in the seconds it was over was greeted in Gaza by the Palestinians who elected Hamas to be their leaders with unprecedented euphoria at the greatest Palestinian breakthrough since the Nakba in 1948. That's who they've chosen to support. And I can't even get started on the stories that our kids are telling us from university campuses. And we are giving them support, and we will continue to give them support and give them the vocabulary and the fortitude because they're afraid to be Jewish right now, some. I'm supposed to give a nechemta. Thank you for the rant. There is some good news and some glimmers of hope. I did not receive one phone call from any elected official, not one. Local, state, nada. And by the way, I'm not surprised. But I am grateful that Pastor Bruce Johnson, Pastor Terry Mackey, Dr. Zudi Jazzer all reached out within 24 hours. Good for them. And I'm so grateful to be colleagues with them in this community. We received some beautiful notes from churches in the neighborhood. Just little notes, sweet notes with quotes from Deuteronomy about the Jewish people and how wonderful we are and how they're thinking of us at this time. I attended two prayer vigils, one with many, many, many of you at the JCC last week, which is so heartwarming and uplifting. And another in the Orthodox community jointly held at Or HaTorah last week. I'm only sad to report that I was the only non-Orthodox rabbi in attendance. A WhatsApp group has been formed by about 350 20-somethings in our community who are feeling lost and alone and helpless. And next week we'll be organizing a Zoom meeting for them to include staff from CAMERA, the committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting, the director of which will be speaking to Congregation Beth Israel in January. They'll be providing a staff person for us. You're not invited, unless you're in your 20s. I'm sorry. 
we're bringing one of our staff members from last summer, Mayan, who after her service in the IDF did what lots of students do, pre-students do. She came to camp last summer and worked for nine weeks at Camp Stein. And then she went on her post-IDF journey with a couple of people, and she's in Peru, feeling lonely and alone, knowing she can't go home right now because it's both dangerous and she would have nothing to do but sit in a bomb shelter for the next month or two, and asked to come to Beth Israel to volunteer, to be given some work. And so we're helping to fly her here, putting her up. One of our members is loaning her a car, and we are putting together the funding now to employ her for the next couple months here because she just wants to be with her family. Finally, I want to share one last story. A non-Jewish friend who is part of a pool of friends who are part of a mini alumni association, if you will, of Cornell University. They withdrew all of their funding this last week. And this non and my understanding, it was seven, several millions of dollars. A non-Jewish friend who texted me when I said, thank you, thank you, thank you, texted me and said they withdrew their alumni dollars, millions, from Cornell because never again is now. I know with every fiber of my being that the IDF and the people of Israel will prevail. I know this. They will prevail because if we learned anything these past two weeks, it is that the citizens of Israel really love each other, really care about each other, would drive across the country to bring someone into their home from one of the areas in the south, from Ashdod, to stay with them, to feed them. And they know, every Israeli I have reached out to this last week, they know and are so very grateful for our love. I think they understand that they need us too and that we need them more. We need them more to be safe and to be vigilant and to defeat Hamas, not just punch them back in the nose, but destroy them. They are grateful. They know that we're their family. Am Yisrael Chai. I conclude now, I know it's been long, with the final stanza of Maud Sur. It's a paradoxical call for a forever end to evil and a prayer for a real, true peace for children of Israel everywhere, even when we're mindful of how many people just don't give a damn about us. Hashoch zaroa kichecha v'kerev katz hayeshua. Nekom nikmat avdecha meuma harsha'a. Bear your holy arm and hasten the end for salvation. Avenge the vengeance of your servant's blood from that wicked nation. For the triumph is too long delayed for us, and there is no end of the days of evil. Repel the red one into the nethermost shadow and establish for us the seven shepherds. The ultimate triumph may indeed be too long delayed for our people and for us as it was for our ancestors. But we pray nonetheless that Am Yisrael, the people of Israel, will make every effort possible in thought and in deed on the fields of battle, battle and in the fields where our children play on playgrounds to defeat evil so they can just live. To remember Amalek and remember that there should be consequences and will be consequences and to be okay with there being consequences even if it makes us a tiny bit uncomfortable, for that kind of evil that befell our Jewish people, our brothers and sisters, both on October 7th and way back when during Hanukkah. Adonai Ozlea Moitain. Adonai Varechet Amova Shalom. May God give strength, please, O oh God, to our people. And may God give our people peace.
please, O oh God, now and forever. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.